everybody to this evening's presentation of Your Freedom Hub's Free Market Cash Patient. I'm your host Jeff Cantor along with my co-host Charles Froman. Got a great guest in store for tonight but first off remember we are being sponsored by Your Freedom Hub. It's where all the activists and entrepreneurial types tend to hang out. Also just so you know we are be recording these so these are the various channels. Now, we do offer you the chance to come and hear these on a regular basis. So the top there is your registration link, and you'll get a notice every week when a new one's coming. And then meanwhile, independently, all of these are recorded. So these are the, and these are case sensitive, by the way, the channels where you'll see these. And just to show you a quick gander, here's just a sampling of what's out there. This is just on the first page of what's up on Brighteon. So you'll see there's a, an ocean of videos to take advantage of and, and learn some stuff that we've dealt in the past. And really all this stuff is very current, frankly. But let's dig into what's going to happen tonight. And this is going to be an exciting one. So Charles, why don't you do a little bit of an introduction here for us? Sure, Jeff, and welcome, Paul. This is exciting for Jeff and me for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, it, it stokes our ego a bit because when we met Paul online through LinkedIn and heard about his long career as a case managing nurse for chronically ill and catastrophically injured patients, we learned that uh, from his experience, he had bigger ideas and grandiose desires to reform the health system. And he was brainstorming with me how to do that because of you know, my background as a lobbyist. And lo and behold, he, he gathers some money and starts making a documentary. And then he ends up at this American Council of Health Trustees meeting in D.C. And he puts uh, Jeff, me, and some of our friends on camera and a whole bunch of other folks, uh, very professionally produced. And he asks us all these questions about how do we fix health care. And now he, now he has a documentary, Diagnosing Healthcare, which is done, essentially. Uh, he's going to get it out here pretty soon, within a month or so. And as we're locked down for COVID, he's going to treat us to an excerpt of this documentary and take Q&A and tell us what he hopes to be the goal of this documentary. So this is exciting, Jeff. Very much so. I have to agree. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to give you a little chance to chat, and then we're going to get a chance to get a sampling of the video. So why don't you kind of set the tone and, and set the context for everybody? So, um, as Charles was saying, uh, you know, I, it's, it's true. I've been doing case management for about 20 years, um, have my own case management company, medical case management. And uh, in that time, started to uh, develop uh, some ideas for healthcare reform. Um, took those ideas to Congress and only got so far, it wasn't really, um, the timing wasn't right, I guess. It, what I was told as far as uh, trying to uh, push further initiative um, through Congress uh, at that point. So started looking at uh, other ways to get my message out and, um, you know, the ideas of healthcare reform. And that's when I came up with the idea of a, a grassroots movement, um, creating a documentary, getting the word out that way. Uh, hopefully this film will be on Netflix and get uh, wide distribution uh, to get the same ideas across, only bypassing Congress uh, doing that. So um, the documentary has in it um, the free market healthcare system, uh, which is what this webinar, uh, you know, is primarily about is the free market healthcare system. Um, but it also has um, my own plan uh, as part of the documentary uh, which is called Coordinated Care for All. Um, and I'll get into that a little further after we uh, preview this segment of the film. Uh, this segment's about 20, 21 minutes long, and uh, it's the free market healthcare portion of the documentary that we'll be watching. 
studies on how to make how to bring the cost of health care down while making people healthier. But boy, it's very slow going. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to save money while also bypassing bureaucracy and improving the provider-patient relationship? So I've been advocating for free market health care for a long time. And in that time, I have had a uh, congressional uh, health care. I've had a, a health care plan that was provided to me by the state of Florida. Um, I had one from the National Center for Policy Analysis. And now I run my own business and I had a great plan there. Obamacare passed and um, I had a worse plan that cost more money and I've slowly been getting a worse plan that cost more money. And then I looked around and said, I've been advocating for free market health care for 10 years. Um, these healthcare sharing ministries, I've heard the good stories about them. I've seen them doing good things. And um, so I actually joined one last year and it's been interesting. I, um, I still think it's the Wild West. It's an emerging market. I mean, the frontiersmen were called frontiersmen for a reason. They were, they were out on the edge doing something. But when you look at the economics behind them, the economics is solid. If you look at their books, the books are solid. If you read stories on the way that um, they've paid for patients, they're all solid. And in fact, it's one of the biggest things in this market is that they all don't want anybody to mess up because since it's cutting edge and since it's a little different than the being a blue cross and blue shield member they don't want anybody to have a problem and so they're all kind of working together to make sure that the system works for people and so i've had a great experience being on it um my uh it, there's a learning curve because you have to unlearn some of the things that you have been used to from insurance but it's wild uh even the people that work at the offices are kind of amazed at the prices that you end up getting because you're paying cash and um it's really kind of a good feeling to push the healthcare system ourselves while being uh insured and in some form of fashion obamacare helped sick people access coverage that they maybe couldn't have in certain cases which is kind of a lie because before obamacare most people who were sick could get care it might have been a bit more expensive and run by the state government it's called a, a reinsurance pool for the sick uninsured pool and otherwise if you are somewhat healthy your private insurance on the individual state level is pretty affordable and Medicaid was there for the poor, Medicare for the old and disabled. We had a pretty good system. Now it's a pretty good system for the people who are really sick. Their premiums are subsidized a bit. For the vast upper middle class, they're getting hurt by having to pay what effectively is a mortgage for health care. So they're either leaving insurance as a million people have for sharing to get coverage that's affordable or they're going uninsured, which is risky, or they're, I don't know what they're doing to qualify for a subsidy on the exchange, but if you don't have a subsidy, you're paying over a grand a month in health care and then several thousand dollars in deductible. So effectively, you have become a cash pay patient because it's hard to reach $5,000, $10,000 of a deductible. Most people don't get that sick. You know, 10% of Americans spend three grand of health care a year. So those who use it are sick and need it. They need the help. The vast majority need something cheaper, less comprehensive. Just make sure you don't go bankrupt from cancer, a heart attack, or a bad accident. You can pay little and have that protection. It doesn't prepay for things you might want, but there's trade-offs in life. My name is Jeff Cantor. I'm the founder of YourFreedomHub.com, and we are a disruptor in the freedom industry. So we're also involved in healthcare and a variety of other areas, all about freedom for individuals. What we're able to do is provide you an assistant, as it were, so you've got an expert in the field to be your helper. So if you're a member with us, as an example, you just call a simple phone number, and you're talking to a health expert who can help you figure out how to get a better pricing on an MRI, find a different doctor, shop around for surgeries. Because again, you probably don't know how to do that. You don't have the time for one. You don't have the interest in learning any of that stuff. But you want the solution. 
So we're going to give you a fast way to get to the most proper solution possible. A million people who are fairly well-to-do or, or even of modest income have left insurance for sharing. They've bit the bullet, they're happy, they're accessing the same doctors in the hospital, but they're just paying half as much. So they're happy and you can get any kind of sharing plan. Then there are those who like the idea of becoming a cash patient. You, you'll see for primary care what are called direct primary care practices prolif proliferating nationwide. And especially if you're kind of a high user of health care, if you have a lot of meds, if you're a chronically diseased person, you're going to go in a lot, pay that, pay that monthly fee of a 75 bucks or 100 bucks. Your, car, your, your primary care physician will give you unlimited or low-cost care. He has access or she has access to labs, tests, good recommendations, 24-hour access for the kids when they have the cold in the middle of the night. That's a great innovation in the market, DPC. Uh, we'll cut the cost of a catastrophic in half, and we'll also double your money in a spending account, called a medical spending account, for the low-level stuff that you know you're going to have. If you're going to have maintenance meds, you want to go to the chiropractor more often. There's now a Forbes featured medical spending account that doubles your money over three years, effectively making all your out-of-pocket 50% less. So Health Excellence Plus is the name of that solution. Uh, where not necessarily the primary care part, but the sharing for the expensive stuff and the account for your first dollar discretionary stuff is pretty cheap for 400, 300 a month. So that's going to make people's eyes open up and we make you into a cash payer. So now there's no networks. We didn't even talk about how insurers handcuff you with networks that exclude the best doctors or hospitals. That's something that we're definitely telling people about. It's not just your price, it's also the handcuffs and networks. We make into a cash payer, so there's no networks and there's no need for networks. We'll help you shop nationwide, wherever you want to go to. Medical tourism internationally, more natural care where a lot of folks want to go. Health Excellence Plus is the plan for the individual, family, or small business person in open enrollment to cut your costs in half, become a cash shopping patient, and really take control of this awful health system. The question oftentimes is how important is it to be a cash payer? And the reality is it's very important. The market understands pricing signals. Everyone's familiar with going to a corner where there's a gas station on every corner and they're all fighting for that price. So I get to see the pricing signals and I know where to go. Same thing when it comes to medical care. If I don't understand what anything costs, all I'm worried about is what's my copay, because I think that's my exposure, but I'm forgetting that I'm paying a monthly premium. So the idea of cash is that the whole program and anything I'm going to have done is all defined down to one set price. So I can decide as a consumer which is the place I want to patronize, and without a pricing signal, I'm never going to know that. So being a cash payer is mission critical to the success of healthcare in America. As we call it medical cost sharing, uh, oftentimes under the uh, concept of sharing it's more of a religious approach but realistically it's a very old mentality of how to deal with things it's everybody pooling their resources a common occurrence is to talk about the Amish because in the Amish community they don't really have insurance because let's say your barn burns down tomorrow every neighbor shows up to build you a new barn so the same thing with the community of medical cost sharing is everybody's pooled their financial resources so if anybody within that community actually has a medical expense we're gonna be able to make sure that that's met and it's the most effective methodology because it's very ethical and it's very inexpensive by comparison because you're not layering it up with a lot of added costs and stuff built in there for no good reason, just to pump up the price. It's like any little cartel that formulates over time. You know, if you can kind of get control of an industry and then there's only a couple players after a while, they tend to start to collude together. Whenever any cartel formulates, its sole goal is monopolization of what's going on and afford anybody entering that market. And invariably, they've got the participation of government when it comes to that because they have lobbyists and they patronize them as far as like getting you know votes or giving them money for campaigns. And in return, they're going to help pass those regulations that they're seeking. So it's definitely a fixed little world. Uh, have you ever heard someone say, have you considered sharing? Well, it's half the cost of insurance. It's the third way in politics, too. And you know what? It's not new. It's 100 years old. It's mutual aid. Most folks before World War II got their health care through uh, groups, groups that they belonged to. And they paid a monthly fee. They had a kitty to pay all the bills. Sometimes they had an in-house doctor. It was part of lodge systems they belonged to. We're engaged in a big change, taking on the cartel where 90% of people get their health care through insurance companies that they don't, they don't like. 
We are here to empower patients and to give them more choices so that we can save this market and make it better, not con more controlled and worse. The advantages of being a cash pay patient are um, actually kind of almost hysterical if other people weren't getting taken advantage of by the system. But like if you go to Keith Smith's Oklahoma Surgery Center, you'll pay about 10% of what you would pay at the hospital down the street. And that's just because he doesn't have a full billing staff that he has to hire. He doesn't have to wait 90 to 180 days for payment and then not be sure if he's going to get the payment. And because of this system where he can get payment now, he can even negotiate. So instead of getting paid in cash, he's gotten paid in Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, it, it's kind of an exciting thing in healthcare to see when you're paying with cash, what, what changes. And um, even going to your normal doctor's office, you can see um, price cuts of, you know, anywhere from 10% to 90% on different procedures or office visits. I mean, the goal also is about your wealth, right? I mean, in reality, there's two important things in your world, your health and your wealth. You need both of those. Everything else kind of builds off of those. So when it comes to your wealth, there's a lot of areas that you need to think about. My personal finances, my cost of health care, how much I spend. Where do I get the money to pay for all those things? So we've got a few different mechanisms. In the healthcare world, most people are understanding the idea of a health savings account. And so we're able to help you with those too, where you can actually get money invested. Most people just have it set aside. They take a little tax break, but they're not growing that money. And, and the government's giving you permission to grow that money. So we're going to help them understand how they can grow dollars in a health savings account, but then also we have a medical benefit savings account, which as Charles was mentioning, allows you to double your dollars and even more to pay for first dollar medical expense, because that's the challenge for a lot of people. I've got my insurance or whatever it may be if something bad happens, but you know what, I have a lot of other independent things I have to spend money on. Where does that money come from? And so that's another area we want to address to make sure that you're covered in terms of where you're going to provide for yourself from one extreme to the other. Now, when we look out into the long run, what we need is a patient-doctor relationship, a doctor-patient relationship. And the way that we do that is by giving the patient the power, making the patient the payer. So health savings accounts are really the primary solution for that. Um, John Goodman um, wants to make them Roth health savings accounts, which makes them um, post-tax dollars. And that is a way to further make uh, healthcare money more equal to other money. And so really when you get into the economics of healthcare spending, um, instead of having cheap dollars for healthcare, you should have the a choice between healthcare savings and buying should all be equal. Within the healthcare industry, I have uh, created a distribution system for a cash-based uh, platform that really enables the free market system to sort of uh, begin to change things from uh, a system right now that doesn't work very well for, for patients uh, or providers. So what our program does is um, uh, it takes a technology that is very inclusive and acts as a platform which allows physicians to receive cash payments for medical services that they decide how much they'd like for them to cost and allows them to put their services really onto a free market type of platform. We go to employers and we say, you know, uh, let us talk to your employees about making sure that whatever doctors that they like to see on that platform be on there. And then we set up a system that lets them pay cash for everything that they might need as a healthcare consumer, except for hospitalizations and emergencies which is really the only thing that you need a catastrophic insurance plan for. Going back to 1990 when Bill Clinton becomes president and his wife tried to take over the health care system by shoving everyone into HMOs with Medicare pricing controls, uh, that woke me up and a lot of folks to the alternative which is to open markets to allow supply to expand and prices to come down and options to expand and people to shop around like any other market and get what they want, whether it's allopath, natural, here, overseas. So we work with uh, all the innovators, both in politics and in entrepreneurship, namely healthcare disruption, with various uh, events like weekly podcasts, where we give the cash patients that we create 
some examples of the best doctors and hospitals and integrated therapists that are accessible to them because we make them cash payers and that is the secret niche in this debate that is not discussed anywhere. If you don't create cash payers and help them shop around, you can't have a supply and demand in a market. The demand is flat, it's horrible. People right now are slapping down third party insurance cards and expecting someone else to pay for it. That's unsustainable. You can't have smart others running a market. You have to run the market. We give you the cash to shop around and then politically, as people educate themselves paying cash to save money and learn about choices, they start to be suspicious of the people in control who are telling them they can't access a life-saving drug or a natural therapy or go overseas or see this kind of payment company, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much information out there. We don't know who to trust, but they trust their benefits broker. So benefits brokers are really, and a lot of people are saying this, are the key to uh, really helping mobilize this free market system that's out there. And so we seek to work with folks that are in that arena. All the big healthcare systems, they want to be the center of excellence for, uh, you know, everyone. But they're going to, you know, at some point come to a reckoning where they realize that they've got to become much more consumer friendly and pay attention to all the things that other industries have had to pay attention to as well. You know, we're not trying to, uh, you know, cut anybody out. We just have a system that arranges for anyone who can add value, and bring the things that consumers need and want to, to really stay as healthy as possible. There's plenty of room for them if they're doing the right things. One of the things we see on Capitol Hill is actually something that the founders set up, and that's that it's actually hard to pass a, a law. It's hard to pass a bill. And uh, so we have the House, and the House is representative. They're called representatives, but it's representative of the country. The House is hot. It's the teacup. And you never know what's going to come out of it, and you never know what they're going to say, but they're representative of the country at large. And then you have the Senate, and the Senate is the tea saucer. So it sits below the hot tea. And so when the hot tea spills out into the Senate, it's the cooling place. So in the Senate, one senator can stand up and stop a bill. And that, I think, is an important thing for the country um, because that means that uh, the minority is always represented. Um, but it can be frustrating when we want to pass a bill. We want something to pass now, but one senator can stand up and stop it. All of the senators have to understand how important uh, a free market healthcare is, how important a functioning healthcare market is for it to work. People are typically very smart. Oftentimes I've had dealings, and I've been in the industry over 30 years, and I've had dealings with you know, some inner city areas. And the, and the person in that area may not be a highly educated person as far as like book learned, but the reality is that they're extremely smart when it comes to common sense. So that's a universal trait most people have across all spectrums and colors and ages and whatever it may be, if you allow that to occur. And so that's what's been the passion is how do we get more autonomy and freedom into all markets and the most egregious by far is health. So that's really kind of the low hanging fruit because it affects everybody. Everybody's going to get sick at one point and if that's not a, if that's not a free market, we're all going to suffer. Your health is going to be affected one way or another and you would think it would be really important for people to pay attention to that and sadly they don't. So we're here to stimulate traffic to get people to become more aware and frankly when everybody does become aware they get more involved. And what that's doing is building the grassroots information of what's going on in the system. The more people that are uh, MediShare members, healthcare sharing members, the more people that go to a DPC practice, the more voters understand about what's going on, the more Congress will listen. So when you look at a staffer, we already, they're 28 years old, they don't make much money, um, they're up working in the capital to make America a better place, um, but the people that are coming into the office that might offer them a better future happen to be the lobbyists for the hospitals um, and the big healthcare providers. Those are the people that come in with the money. So if you're a staffer and you're looking to help somebody, are you going to help a, a sharing plan that only has one lobbyist on Capitol Hill that isn't paid the same as uh, 
you know, the middle Blue Cross and Blue Shield lobbyist, the staff are kind of, uh, their profit motive is to help the big healthcare providers more. So what we have to do is change the grassroots. We have to educate voters. We have to change the marketplace. And I think that we're on our way to that, but it's going to be a long road before we get all the way there. Uh, I started covering Washington um, the pretty much the, the year that Reagan got inaugurated and, and Tip O'Neill was a Speaker of the House. And I used to know this, I used to know President Reagan's chief speechwriter and I knew Tip O'Neill's press secretary, Chris Matthews and, and Tip and, and President Reagan used to get together and they got along, they disagreed. It's very sad that that doesn't happen anymore. And I, I find it really unfortunate that we're not, we're not uh, see, seeking a middle ground, but I do see promise and I see things like um, the Koch brothers have a foundation stand together that's working on health, education, criminal justice reform. I think more more people just need to realize there are ways that there are ways to solve the problem by working together, and you don't. It doesn't have to be so divisive. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to talk a bit and do well. You know, we are going to have a lot of stock. Uh, imagery uh, that's going uh, inverted. It's, it's not just going to be the pregnant interviews that you actually see in the document. It's the editing process. Uh, but the film will be uh, released here within about two weeks in the distribution and, and that sort of thing. So just kind of the business end at that point, um, seeing who's going to, to put Uh, so we'll see how it goes. There's a lot of work um, left even when you finish. But um, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to work on it and to, to work with um, guys like Charlie and Jeff, um, you know, to, uh, to create this film. But uh, if I could uh, go ahead and share my screen, uh, Jeff, I'll go ahead and, and kind of talk about my um, my healthcare plan a bit, and then we can take some questions. Charles, are you there a minute? Why don't you chime in for a second while we're waiting Do you, for Paul to recover? Do you want to comment a bit, Jeff, on your presentation? So yeah, um, well, it was it was a very interesting. It was nice what was happening there too, because if you may have noticed in the background, and I and he did film all over the place, but the segment that we showed tonight, because he wanted to showcase the free market stuff, was in this really nice uh, Washington. What's what age was that property? We were at eighteen something, maybe you know early eighteen hundreds. There was phenomenal streets there in Washington, and they rented this historic mansion. And so they filmed in there and they had a whole parade all day long of people. We were like just a couple of hour block during the whole day. And, uh, and it was a fantastic venue to do it. And what a great cavalcade of people he had. All right, Paul, you're back. Oh, yeah, I apologize. I'm having some connectivity issues, but uh, let me go ahead and, and share my screen here. All right. Good. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you see that okay? Yes. Um, yeah, so I know it says coordinated care for all, um, and that's kind of a, a play on Medi uh, Medicare for all, coordinated care for all. Um, whether or not we have a universal healthcare system, uh, the same principles that would apply to a universal uh, care system would actually apply to the private sector uh, as well. And, and in fact, I'm looking to adopt the same principles, um, in fact, to uh, the free market healthcare system, uh, too. So, uh, just kind of bearing that in mind, um, the the average cost savings from this plan uh, that I've calculated are roughly about 40% um, cheaper than than Medicare for all um, without these uh, things implemented that are in the plan. Uh, so, if we think about that, that's about 1.4 trillion dollars a year. Um, that you know that, that decreases the burden on the cost of the healthcare system for the United States. So um, just kind of bearing that in mind, we'll kind of look through some of the the principles um, that are offered in the plan. Uh, so for the first one is prediction of risk. Um, basically, uh, what that entails um, 
is voluntarily submitting uh, a genetic profile. Uh, and it would be something similar to what people do with 23andMe, how they can submit a, a genetic profile and then uh, they would get a report based on that in terms of uh, medical risk. Um, you know, for certain conditions and, and diseases, for example, diabetes. Um, so we're, we're able to do more and more things. And I would uh, think that um, going forward, we're, it's going to be more advanced certainly than it is now in terms of risk prediction. Um, and that's something that we're not really tapping into very much. I mean, there's a little kind of dabbling out there with that, but um, to the extent that I would like to implement these things uh, into the plan, uh, it would be uh, certainly more robust, but still voluntary. We're not going to, um, you know, force anyone to uh, submit a genetic profile if they don't choose to. And then, of course, you know, you have to, uh, there's, there's a lot of concerns with privacy and not selling the information and, and, and that sort of thing. So certainly we would um, pay a lot of attention to the privacy aspects. Um, you know, after uh, prediction of risk, we have education. I, I was talking about education, then um, the next one is prevention. Obviously, um, you want to prevent a, a certain condition or a deterioration of a condition. Um, that, that's a lot of the cost savings that uh, is associated with the plan. Um, and then going from there, let's see. Yeah, and then we have the, the cost containment uh, aspects, which would be pharmace uh, pharmaceutical legislation, um, as well as more standardized um, practices in terms of hospitals and, and surgery centers and their, their billing practices, which are pretty widely disparate uh, currently. Um, then we have the efficiency aspects. Uh, and the efficiency side of this really is where my background of Forte comes in. That's uh, as a medical case manager. Because uh, it the documentary is not just about free markets. Uh, you know, as you can see from Paul's presentation, it really emanates out of his experience managing uh, chronic and chronically and catastrophically injured patients. Uh, and, pre, you know, that's, that's natural for all of us. We... We, we base our ideas off of our own experience. And sometimes it radically differs with ideas other folks have. Um, so, you know, Dr. Taylor, I know, is a, a liberty activist and surgeon. Maybe he has, uh, you know, some reform ideas that he wants to share, or, or maybe he wants to respond to what he saw from Jeff and Mai's uh, interview on the documentary. Or even Bob Staubel, do you want to, a comment from your vast experience. I know Jeff Ellington on the film, for example, said people trust their benefit brokers. Uh, what do you think about that statement, Bob Staubel? I think they're correct. They trust them, but I use the term the Navy SEALs of benefits broker. 10% of the brokers really care about saving the employer money and are willing to work hard for their commission. 90% um, are uh, very questionable in their intent and their work ethic. So I think um, it's 100% right to say most employers trust their benefits broker, but 90% of them are snookered and misled. And it's not the benefits broker's fault. It's their boss's boss's boss that it's part of their, they're part of their cartel. So I like to call it the evil empire or the, um, axis of evil, there are six large benefit brokers, um, Aon, Mercer, USI, um, Lockton, Gallagher, and um, um, Willis Watson Towers, which is about to merge with Aon. So pretty soon, there's just going to be the big five brokers. They're in collusion with the big five carriers known as the BUCAs, B-U-C-A-H. Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna, and Humana. And so they're, they're, the, there's a carrier cartel, but they're in collusion with the, um, the big five brokers. 10 national companies have so much power. And they are what I call the DOTS Q, D O T S Q, the defenders of the status quo. They have 1.2 trillion reasons to 
lobby against, you know, Paul Roberts. And um, that's how much the uh, 3.6 trillion of healthcare, one third of it goes through about 30,000 US corporations that are self-funded, but 90% of those dollars go through the, um, the Buka cartel. And so the, the, those 10 companies, um, but healthcare is local. So what they do is they go into the, st I, I spent the last 20 years or so in Hartford, Connecticut area. Now I'm in the Boston area uh, for almost two years now, but in Hartford, the state is controlled by Yale New Haven Hospital and Hartford Hospital. They're a duopoly that controls it. And they're so powerful in the state that the local state senators are in their back pocket. So um, what, the, what the, uh, the big 10, the five carriers and the five brokers do is they swoop in on um, locally and they, they invite into their cartel the duopoly usually, it's usually two big systems that are the predatory 800 pound gorillas in, in a, a, a small state like Connecticut. In other states, it would be a region of a state but Connecticut's kind of just one big region. And um, so it's a good target. There's about three and a half million people in, in Connecticut. And um, so uh, if, if you're one of those 10% Navy SEAL brokers, the problem is when you go back to your boss or your boss's boss, um, they, they just teach you how to scare the living shit out of the HR director who scares the living shit out of the CEO and and um, the CFO sitting there saying this makes so much sense, but he he or she gets outvoted by the CEO and the uh, HR director who says all of our employees will unionize and they'll all leave us and they'll all you know that that kind of thing. So so even there a lot of these local brokers that, that locked in or Mercer guy who's the you know the direct broker for the last ten years for um, I worked with Ulbrich Steel in in Connecticut and Chris Ulbrich's a friend of mine. He's an investor in one of the companies I work with uh, and a personal friend, um, he's scared to death of that duopoly because his Mercer guy, 10-year uh, broker, is a very nice guy. I know him personally, but his boss's boss keep feeding him all this misinformation to scare the crap out of Chris Ulbricht, and Chris has just given up. And I've tried to get him to do, um, in, in the mid-market employer, the two-word key to healthcare, the grassroots revolution of the C-suites of middle, middle market companies is just two words, direct contracting. It's the same as, you know, um, when you guys were at the consumer level saying self-pay or, or what, what do you call it, cash payers? Right. Um, I'm trying to turn every CFO in America into being a direct contractor, which is a cash payer. Um, but then they turn to their employee. There are 100 million employees that are spending or are incurring $1.2 trillion a year. And all these employers have to do is direct contract with direct primary care, surgery centers of excellence, other providers that have no insurance codes. And that's what I think is gonna solve healthcare. And the brokers, there is a movement um, sponsored by Health Rosetta, which is a not-for-profit networking group to try to match the good guy brokers, the Navy SEALs, with the curious CFOs who, who are, think they are being hosed by their Mercer guy, uh, who's a nice guy who means well, but he's just a, pu a puppet for his boss's boss. And, um, and by the way, the HR directors of the middle market companies don't really work, like the HR directors at Albrecht, they don't work for Albrecht, they work for Mercer. They're puppets. So Mercer is the puppeteer. Um, Mercer corporate, the local rep is just a puppeteer under them. And they've got the HR directors, um, you know, pl playing their tune under them. So, so the, so the, this conspiracy has spies right in every company. They're called the HR and benefits directors, and they are really working for the cartel. Um, but because that local broker is such a nice guy and really does care about Albrecht Steele, um, uh, they get away with murder. And it's not their fault. It's just like like uh, one of you guys said earlier, these cartels form and they get a life of their own. And uh, I'm a you know, Red Sox fan and, and we hate the Yankees, but we hate the team, not the players, because they might be on the Red Sox next year, right? So I hate the team, the cartel, 
but that those individual local brokers are really good people and their bosses are good people and their bosses bosses are good people but they're all caught up in they have 1.2 trillion reasons this is in the self-funded world that i live in to do everything possible to squash sidera and squash ptx therapy and squash everything that is direct contracting because it goes around the the insurance code system and it it they lose power so sorry for the long answer but but that's how i feel about brokers i feel no, really and, good and that is and that is the big issue and you can see and, and the sad thing is you know we've all kind of like we're born into an existing system and no one has that long generational memory to go why are we not doing what used to work earlier because I just showed up at what we're doing right now. And so that's what we figure it's the way it is. And yeah, everybody's kind of good old boy club in its own little way. Paul, I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of give, give you back the floor since you finally got back control of technology. What was it that you wanted to kind of conclude well, with? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. Do we, do we happen to uh, happen to have any other questions? Um, oh, sure. We can uh, certainly field some other ones. Uh, if anybody would like to raise their hand, Charles, did you have some you wanted to kind of, feed in oh, there too real quick sure and before i do just a quick comment on, on bob's always excellent uh, commentary on, on the big business benefits world which is which is different uh, from the individual health world and that is our pre presenter next week is dave burbage from the levitt group uh who is one of our primary big business benefit brokers uh, for the cash pay revolution that we're introducing through our wow cash appointments platform and you, you saw on the documentary jeff ellington a partner of jeff's and mine uh with that wow health um uh, sentence below his 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 figure so that's that's part of our, our operation that's our app to, to facilitate uh, cash paying for uh, all, all the appointments um but um paul given what we saw of your presentation in your coordinated care ideas emanating from your case management experience. You know, what you showed with uh, Charlie Sauer and the, the Jeffs and me uh, probably radically differs from your uh, participants, your documentary for the other side of healthcare reform. Can you kind of summarize real quick uh, how your other um, participants, you know, are solving healthcare, which I, I imagine diametrically opposes what we uh, heard tonight? Well, um, I, I wouldn't say opposes uh, at all. In, in fact, I, I think that, um, you know, with coordinated care for all, you know, my, my plan, for example, um, it uh, works hand in hand, actually, or it, it certainly can work hand in hand uh, with the free market healthcare uh, system. Uh, you know, it, it entails primarily coordination of care. That's, that's really what it boils down to. You're, you're making sure everyone's on the same page. Things aren't uh, slipping through the cracks. Uh, things get done quicker, more efficiently. Uh, it really cuts out a lot of the inefficiencies in the system. Um, plus, there's a, a big prevention basis um, that, that's involved with the plan. So that, that in a nutshell, that kind of um, summarizes what it is. And very good. All right. Let's see what else are there questions. What about uh, Dr. Taylor? Um, Jeff, do you want to invite his views as a, as a surgeon uh, liberty activist? Oh, that would be a great perspective. Dr. Taylor, are you there? I have you unmuted. So we were able to get him to respond here. Not sure if he's connected well. Or Patsy Reitzman. I know she's been a past presenter with her help for people confused and ripped off by hospital bills. And she's a great activist online. We want to ask uh, Patsy Reitzman, Jeff. Sure. I got her unmuted. Go ahead, Patsy. I have a question about, uh, Paul, I, I so um, can relate to not being able to have success going through the legislative process or Congress. So if, if you're not going in that direction, tell me what you're doing. What, what is the other direction? How can we collectively help this occur if Congress is not the direction? Right. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that the... Uh, well, certainly Congress has to pass any legislation. We know that, you know, even if you have a president, for that matter, a presidential candidate that wants to go a certain direction, 
uh, with health, uh, with health care, um, you still have to have the support of Congress to, to pass that legislation. We know that. Um, so it's really a matter of informing and educating the public, uh, which is what this documentary is about, uh, so that they can uh, contact their congressmen, write to their congressmen, and stand up for these principles, these ideas. Um, and, and so that's where the grassroots movement comes from, is, is trying to educate the public and rally the support. Uh, and then there's, there's a bit in the documentary about uh, how to contact your, your local congressman. You know, if you believe in the principles of, you know, what's presented in the documentary uh, to show that support. Very good. You know, I was gonna say, Jim Graypick, are you there? I'm gonna unmute you for a quick minute. Yeah, I'm here. I want to see, you know, you guys have been working on some interesting concepts, health oriented wise. What's kind of your take on, on what's going on in this industry? Gosh, I'm kind of, cons well, I'm not consumed with what's happening in this, the takeover of, of our country, but, uh, <laughs> but it's certainly the four, first thing on my mind, right? Freedom, liberty, you know, the Chicago mayor saying, "If you here, here you go, talking about health, if you go outside to exercise, we're going to arrest you. Okay? So, you know, with that kind of an atmosphere, it, it makes me wonder, I mean, I think we're really, anything we try to do now uh, is going to get more pushback than even normally, you know? So, uh, but that aside, all I can hope for, I, mean, I don't know if I can do my video for a second, got to go in a minute, but I'll... Uh, uh, I cannot do the video because, oh, you stopped it. <laughs> it's your fault, Jeff. Anyway. Here it is. I fired it back up. You fired it back up? Okay. I asked you to start the video. Thanks. There you oh, are. Oh, close there to the camera. Okay. So, um, where were we? I, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that if things get to a really co a collapse in a lot of ways, uh, maybe we have a chance to really rebuild a system that works. Yeah, our idea is to work with you guys and uh, or, or the uh, Paul Roberts out there to in our facilities that we are expecting to build around the country and have a new kind of integrative medicine, more comprehensive, but some of the things you touched on would be in there in these uh, in pavilions. and um, And to also provide... Uh, we, we're calling it American New Medicine, by the way, just because it's American. The best of everything put together, and that includes, uh, you know, uh, healthcare plans. But in the meantime, yeah, I've really been focused on trying to get people to really, it's, I, I don't know, I call me crazy. I don't think it's business as usual. I know it's going to happen. I'm just working on, I got my hands on a lot of things. You know, I see these protesters out in uh, Michigan and a few places. The, Facebook is, is just pulling them off so that nobody can organize. And I thought, huh, I wonder if there are any other platforms out there. I mean, I'm not yet. We're actually, I'm working with the Wharton Club to bring const a constitutional lawyer in. We're doing some webinars. Uh, anyway, I'm getting off track. But look, I think what you guys are working on is great. It's, it's absolutely needed. Um, I, I think about it when I talk to people, what's the point of insurance if, if conventional medicine is, is part of the problem? And if that's killing you when you go in, why pay for, for insurance in a sit, right? I mean, there are, you know, there are four cures out there for COVID-19 that are all working very well, but it's gotta be the vaccine. And, uh, you know, and we're getting a lot of BS from the hospitals. And, you know, I think like most of you guys, for the most part, I don't trust them. And it's not because they're not nice people, like you said, or maybe they don't, a lot of them don't know better. That's the way they've been brought up. But uh, this is a real educational process. And um, that's what I've been working on. Dr. McClure has been working on. And, you know, we'll keep at it. 
you know, Jim, and that's good. And you know what, and it's good to hear your perspective in that regard, but it just goes to show, look at how many people just in this last few minutes we've run through, they're all trying to get to a similar end and everybody kind of working in their own independent little world to make that a reality. So it's, it's pretty encouraging. And like you said, I think like in any disaster, that's very often when opportunity arises because we were commenting earlier, you know, telemedicine used to be just hardly known and now suddenly everybody's getting to make use of it and wanting to and states that used to say if you're licensed in this state you can't come to this state and now suddenly they're waiving all these licensing requirements so in the spite of all the horror there's actually a couple of decent things it's just if we can survive the collapse part <laughs> that's going to be mission critical for sure wait hold on a sec wait i got gotcha. you go ahead what were you saying we can get telemedicine and and beer and drinks to go so it's it's good yeah so there you go so go ahead paul what, what would be your response to some of these comments oh I, I think they're on point especially you know you, you talk about telemedicine for example i mean that's something uh the COVID situation has really brought out into the um into the sun but it's also in my documentary it's part of my segment uh telemedicine uh, technology, um, AI for that matter, artificial intelligence, you know, and, and that kind of integration uh, with the prevention focus, it's, it's all in there as well. So we do try to offer innovative solutions. Um, the, the first part of the documentary about the first half um, goes through how the system is broken and you're hearing stories uh, from, from various uh, folks, uh, you know, that are telling their, their heartfelt you know, uh, personal um, an anecdotal stories, you know, uh, about um, the rising cost of healthcare mm -hmm. and, and those sorts of things. Very good. Well, unfortunately, we've kind of come to the end of our time frame here. So I definitely want to tell you thanks for being here today. I'm going to definitely post some of these different links and stuff so people can follow up there with you accordingly. And definitely, we're all looking pretty forward to this release. Besides Netflix, where else do you think you might have this thing in distribution in, in the short term? In the short term? Uh, festivals, yeah. Uh, we're, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, we're we're uh, submitting to various film festivals. Yeah, oh, at this point. Okay. So that that'll okay. be a circuit, and then uh, and then the wider distribution. Okay. And then you know we'll obviously get the word out. How else are you kind of putting the word out? Are you guys pushing on Twitter or Facebook or what else are you going to do to kind of get the the buzz around yeah, we, or just well, rely on social media? Yeah, we we've got okay. pretty much all the the social media outlets um, working. Plus. Killer. Excellent. Well, we're hoping it all works out well. And because just like Jim said, it's about education and your film will go a long way with all the different elements you cover in there. And we're certainly we're glad and proud to be a part of it for sure. So thanks so much for being a part of this tonight, Paul. Oh, thank you.